Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight on a special Thursday night, night light. Uh, it's been a rough week. Uh, Barbara still has the plague. On Tuesday, some red-haired guy said I was a very bad man. And I just don't want our guest tonight to call me obtuse and send me to a month in solitary confinement. Uh, yeah, he he's back like the rock Shasa. Uh, Mark Dewisiak is returning to discuss his just published the Shawshank Redemption revealed. If you are around fifty, uh, yeah, your introduction to Stephen King may have been seeing The Shining. Uh, yeah, it was a great movie, terrible adaptation. Um, and, you know, and as the years went on, you, know, you went to the mall to see all the Stephen King adaptations. Yeah, you know, Firestarter was pretty good. And, you know, Christine was you know, uh, uh, you know, a good one. Uh, Ch- Children of the Corn. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that was bizarre. Um and then there was the one about the rats in the uh, mill. Uh, that was awful. Um, that, was, well, that was a little bit more like you know, just someone just trying to cash in on uh, Stephen King's name. But um, you know, later in the eighties, you know, there were some movies adapted from uh, Stephen King short stories and books that were not your traditional horror movies, but they were excellent movies, uh, you know, like Stand By Me, Dolores Claiborne, uh, Misery, and that was a little bit more of a, a horror, horror movie, movie, and you know, it's kind of becoming a little autobiographical since Nightlight has its own number one fans like Seminole Lisa and the Human Billboard, but uh, the most celebrated of all the uh, Stephen King adaptations was Shawshank Redemption. And it's one of the best movies to be made in the last 25 years and acclaimed as one of the best movies of all time. Um, Mark's book celebrates the 20, <clears throat> 25th anniversary of the Shawshank Redemption's release on September 23rd, 1994. Uh, Mark is a TV critic for the Cleveland Plain Dealer and is a film studies professor at Kent State University. If you like uh, it, like the behind the scenes uh, stories, uh, you know, making of your you know, favorite movies, um, and you want to understanding, you want to extend your understanding of this 
classic movie, I highly recommend you get Shawshank Redemption Revealed. Um, so I just want to bring Mark on. Hi, Mark, how are you? Oh, very good, thanks. Good. Um, you know, let's – before we get to the movie, um, I would just need to start – with the original Stephen King publication, uh, I think that that'd be a good place to see where the idea was originally presented, and you know we'll just keep going from there. Uh, but it, it, that came out in 1982. Is that right? The, the the original uh, short uh, novella. I, I'm sorry, Mark. You just patched out there, and I did. I missed the question. Oh, I, 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 oh it, <laughs> the, 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 so say, the, say that again. <laughs> the novella came out in 1982, correct? That's right. Different okay. thing. Uh, it was the name of the book, and uh, it had four novellas in it. Okay. Uh, and and each each novella was uh, representing a season, hence the title of the book. And uh, the first one in the the book is a novella that was called Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, and uh, it's the story that we know. And uh, two of the best movies to uh, come that have ever been made from Stephen King's work come out of that one book, and, and a third one which isn't bad because. The Body Was Turned Into Stand By Me by Rob Reiner. And then, of course, Frank Darabont makes uh, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption into the Shawshank Redemption. And then there's a third story in there called Apt Pupil. And Apt Pupil is an underrated little movie with, uh, um, with Ian McKellen. And it's a, ter- it's, a, it's a very frightening story, even though, like the other two, there's nothing supernatural about it. Um, but it's... It's a very, very scary story, and so three pretty good movies uh, come out of that one book. Okay, and you, know, you state in you know, your book that the novella is based on a Leo Tolstoy uh, novella. So Loosely, yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would say that some of the, 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 the literary influences, you could also say it was based on old Warner Brothers movies, too, I suppose. Okay. Um, a lot goes into the stew uh, that is the, the, that story, and then that goes into that movie, because then, you know, Frank Darabont takes it, and Frank Darabont had a lot of influences, uh, like Frank Capra movies and, and mm-hmm. different things that, that he applied to his adaptation. So th- th- there's a lot of resonance that's behind both the novella and the movie because there are uh you know i would always say this about um writers good writers um you, you show me a good writer and i'll show you good influences and uh you, you know it's like uh jk rowling is a very good example of that is that uh when jk rowling's books came along and my daughter was was reading them when she was very small, uh, and I, when I was looking at them and I was thinking, you know, the, somebody gave this woman very good books when she was a kid, and I would be shocked that if some of those books weren't G.K. Chesterton and Tolkien and Kipling and uh, all these wonderful things that show up in those books, those influences are all there. And, uh, you know, with Stephen King, I think he'd be the first to tell you that uh, he was influenced by a lot, acres and acres of good writing. He mm-hmm. basically says that in his book on writing. If you look at his uh, – which is, by the way, uh, one of the best books on writing anybody has ever done. It's one of the only two uh, books on writing that I recommend because it was written by a real writer who knows – what it means to put nouns and verbs together and get paid for it and get uh, and make a living doing that. Um, if you want to take advice from somebody, do you want to take advice from somebody you've never heard of? Or how about Stephen King? Maybe you've heard of him. Um, mm-hmm. So I, you know, the, his book on writing is not only a, a, a sensational 
book for writers. It is also, I think, because it's such a deeply personal book, I think it's the closest thing Stephen King is ever going to get to writing a, an autobiography. And he gets – he plays it real in that book. He talks about the addictions. He talks about the bad times. He talks about the accident because the book was done and was on his desk when the, the horrible accident that nearly killed him um, uh-huh. occurred. And he talks about all of these things in very – minute detail it's a very compelling book it's a very compelling read and uh and like i said it's it's a book i highly recommend uh to anybody who is thinking about writing as a trade uh because it's not theory it's how you really do it uh, 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 what's the name of it on writing oh okay that's a, that's a very simple title on writing and uh it, it is it's, it's a true and it's in paperback it, it's the you're going to find it in hardcover and paperback, and it is a sensational book. And if you want to get inside Stephen King's mind um, and really see, you know, I mean, it, to the level where he talks about the addiction um, and says, you know, here's a guy who who wrote an entire book, The Shining, which was a basically a depiction of a man in the throes of addiction, and he didn't know that he that's what he was writing. Um, because he was in the throes of addiction at that point. And um, he says at one point in that book that he has no memory of writing Cujo. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing statement mm-hmm. to make? He said that he has no memory of writing Cujo. And he said, you know, that um, he wish he had because he'd gone, he's gone back and he's read the book and there are passages in it that he likes a great deal. And he wishes he could remember what the creation of that book was like. So, um, so he's, it's a very honest book. It's a very, very, uh, you know, you hear the word painfully honest. It is that and then some as far as uh, his, his his writing life goes. You know, Mark, now, now that you mentioned that, it, you know, it, it can I can segue us into you know, uh, my next talking point was uh Ann Rice I saw an interview with Ann Rice and she, you know, she, she doesn't remember writing interview with a vampire but it, you know, that movie came out 25 years ago as well um yeah so when the Shawshank Redemption was released it's you know the other you know big, big name movies at the time were like Forrest Gump you know Pulp Fiction Lion King Interview the Vampire uh, all of them you know were very, very popular as soon as they came out um, yeah you know, the Shawshank Redemption was uh, Pretty much a flop at, at, at the beginning. That's, uh, there, there's no good way to say it, you know. And it did get run over at the box office by, um, particularly Pulp Fiction, which came out just about at the same time, and just took all of the air, you know, right out of the room. So uh, Shawshank Redemption, when it came out, um, the reviews were largely good. There were some negative reviews that you know that, that there's a. The Los Angeles Time review was particularly negative, um, so it's not true that it was universally acclaimed. Um, but no, the box office was very, very disappointing. And um, you know, some films just have to find their way. You know, there are as I say in, in the book, most films that are hits are um, they're sprinters. They get out of the gate, the blocks very, very fast. And, you know, we used to allow films to build audiences through word of mouth and Mm -hmm. through good press. And, you know, since the 1970s, um, we've increasingly put more and more emphasis on the opening weekend. And if you haven't made it in the opening weekend, you you, haven't made it. It's sort of like, well, if you get to the second weekend and you haven't made it. Well, I mean, you know, by that definition, Jaws would have been a failure. 
you know, because Jaws took right. a while that summer to build, and it kept building week after week. It kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because of word of mouth. People kept saying, you've got to go see this movie. You guys was there. I remember that summer of 75 and just how it was spreading like wildfire. And, um, you know, Shawshank, it, it, it's like a lot of movies. If you don't make it in your opening weekend, um, too bad. Now, the good thing is uh, what did not exist in 1975 but did exist in 1994 was home video. You got another shot. And um, Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Home Video, for whatever reason, made the decision to order a lot of copies of the Shawshank Redemption when it went into home video, much more than you would think was warranted by how it had done uh, at the box office. But it proved to be a really, really good move because the turnaround is immediate. People think, well, the Shawshank Redemption, it was gradually rediscovered. It wasn't that gradual. It was really the next year. When it was released on home video, it became one of the hottest, most successful home video releases uh, of the year and of all time. And at the same time, 25 years ago, uh, this fall, uh, Ted Turner started Turner Classic Movies, and he decided to show The Shawshank Redemption a lot. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so the combination between the cable viewings and the home video. And that, by the way, that path had already been pioneered by another film with a strong Ohio connection, which was a Christmas story. Um, a Christmas story had been, was, was also a box office. They had, they had filmed a good deal of the uh, exteriors in Cleveland. Um, and it too had a, um, a disappointing box office, and it too was discovered on home video and cable viewings. So uh, I don't know what it is about movies with Ohio connections, but the same thing happened to the Shawshank Redemption. Um, and and then it very very what has been gradual is how it has slowly risen on the lists and polls of favorite movies, to the point that it is now number one at IMDb in front of The Godfather. Um, so whatever is there, whatever the magic is there, uh, it cuts across all, all barriers. It, you know, men like it, women like it. Um, you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book, I mean, there, there are a lot of reasons I wrote this book. One of the reasons I wrote the book was that um, I, was, I, I was a witness. Um, I, I, was act, I was a film critic for the Akron Beacon Journal in 1993 when the movie showed up uh, in Ohio. And most films that shoot on location, they they may spend a couple of days out on location, maybe a couple of weeks. This film was here in Ohio, primarily in a town called Mansfield. It was, which is where the Ohio State Reformatory was, which became the Shawshank State Prison in the movie, which is practically a character. And it's a magnificent Victorian Gothic structure. Its nickname was Dracula's Castle among prisoners when it was an active prison. And it's, it's that incredible prison you see in the movie. And it's still standing and you can still tour it. And people come from all over the world just to put their hands on that building because it's Shawshank. Um, so in 93, when the, the, I got a fax, remember faxes? I got a fax from the Ohio Film Commission saying there's they're going to film a movie in Mansfield, and it was still then titled the what the novella was titled, which was Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. And um, the head of the Ohio Film Commission was Eve Lapola at the time, and she basically said, you know, um, would you like to cover the making of the film? We can arrange interviews. And, uh, you know, well, this was a major stay. They were here for three months in 1993. The three summer they shot the three summer months June July and August, and they were here for two months before that in pre production and then a month after in post production, so they were here for six months, and um, during that time I I, I did uh, uh, a few stories about the the movie, and the first interview I did was with uh, a fellow by the name of Morgan Freeman, um, which was I did at the. Um, in the shade of the Ohio State Reformatory uh, after a long day of shooting. So um, 
you know, I, I kind of had a connection to this movie, uh, a physical connection to this movie. But um, 25 years later, I was actually working on another book about Stephen King. I was working on a, a bigger book on Stephen King, and my agent was shopping it around. And it was a, it was in uh, late 2017 um, that I kind of realized that the 25th anniversary was coming up. And I got the idea to pull that chapter out on Shawshank and do a deep dive entire book on it. And uh, then I got very, very fortunate because I, um, I, I ended up doing about 70 interviews for the book uh, over the next uh, several months and then wrote the book in late 2018. So it was delivered to the publisher in time to make the 25th anniversary, uh, which is this month. So, um, the, but I, I think one of the, the driving forces that convinced me to write the book was that um, I teach at Kent State, as you said, and I teach, one of the classes I teach is reviewing film and television. And um, I've been teaching that course every semester since 2009 for 10 years. So that twice a year, I sort of get to gauge what my students like and what they don't like. And uh, as the old saying goes, you learn from your students. If you're smart, you learn from your students. And um, every semester, there were two films that I would show them. One was The Grapes of Wrath, the 1940 John Ford film adaptation of John Steinbeck's Pulitzer Prize winning novel. And the second week, I would show them The Shawshank Redemption, the week after. And half the class would love the, the Grapes of Wrath. Uh, for many of them, you have to remember, this was the first black and white movie they'd ever seen. You know, it's the first old movie they'd ever seen. And um, for half the class, the, the Grapes of Wrath was a transformative experience. They were, they were really profoundly moved by the story of the Jodes. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other half couldn't hate it more. It's everything they hate. And they will tell you that. It's slow. It's old. It's black and white. It's chalky. It's all, you know, it's everything they, they, they dislike. You know, I've had students tell me that uh, they should track down every copy of this film and burn it so nobody ever has to sit through it again. Um, so we have a very good discussion on The Graves of Wrath. And then the following week, I show them The Shawshank Redemption. Now, semester after semester, Mark, this is the only film I show that gets close to a 100% favorable response from my students. It, 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 let me repeat that. 100%. Nothing mm -hmm. gets 100%. Nothing. And yet, this movie profoundly touches people who hadn't even been born yet when the movie was made. I'm now showing it to people who weren't born. There, This was it's a 25-year-old film. And I'm showing it to students who are 18, 19, 20. And any film that was made before you were born is an old movie. And yet, they all love it. They all, I mean, they, they are profoundly moved by it. So after the week after I show them The Shawshank Redemption, I would ask them, how come you liked this movie, The Shawshank Redemption, and you didn't like The Grapes of Wrath? when they are essentially the same movie. And they look at me like, what are you talking about? I said, well, thematically, they are the same movie. They are about the same things. They are peop about people crawling through feces, if you will. This is about people who are, are crawling and trying to keep hope alive under desperate circumstances. That's what the Jodes are trying to do, and it is what Andy and Red are doing in the Shawshank Redemption. And I said, so why did you like this one? And they'll say, well, The Graves of Wrath was too long. And I'll say, Shawshank's longer. And they look at me like, how is that even possible? Well, it is. It's about five, six minutes longer than The Graves of Wrath. And I said, so, so next, next objection. Well, the Grapes of Wrath was just too talky. Shawshank Redemption is pretty much all talk. That's pretty much all it is. There are no special effects. There's no CGI. There's no explosions. 
all of the great dramatic moments are in the the are, are in the dialogue, are in the exchanges. Next point, and they really can't articulate what it is. And you know, and I have a theory, you know, and and you know, and I say this in the book, but my theory is that. One of the reasons this movie keeps going up and up and up is that um, when the movie came out in 94, times were pretty good. The economy was good. Um, uh, most things were pretty good on all fronts. It was a pre-9-11 uh, world. Right. And um, in the, 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 this generation that has grown up in the last 25 years since this movie has come out, Times are a little bit more uncertain. Jobs market certainly is a lot more daunting than it was in 94. The economy certainly is more uncertain. We're more divided as a nation than we have been probably at any time since the Civil War. And this is a movie about friendship. It is a movie about hope. It is a movie about redemption. And I think those themes grow in resonance because those themes are more precious now than they were in 94. I think they have more resonance. I think they have more meaning. And it's an incredibly relatable film for that reason. If, if this film could only appeal and you could only relate to this movie because the characters are prisoners, uh, you know, these, these are, this is a movie about convicts. And if if the appeal of this movie was confined to people who have actually been in prison, it would have a very small following. And yet, men relate to it, women relate to it, my students relate to it. And the reason is because you don't have to be in prison physically to be in prison. You right. can be in you can be imprisoned by a whole lot of things, and you can feel trapped by a lot of things. You can feel trapped by a job. You could feel trapped by circumstances. You can feel trapped uh, by a bad relationship. You can feel trapped by addiction. And this movie basically says, um, hold on, hold on, that hope is a good thing. And, uh, you know, in one section of the book, I interviewed uh, uh, Uber fans uh, of the film, and many of them credit this movie get, of getting them through bad times or out of bad situations. What movie does that? What movie has that ability and that power? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's also one that, you know, we were, you had said before that uh, the origin of the story and the Stephen King story goes back to this novella and that uh, uh, this story is, is not a, you know, classically a horror story. Um I've had people say to me, you know, isn't it ironic that some of the best movies uh, made out of Stephen King stories are not horror stories? And then they'll immediately point to Stand By Me, The Shawshank Redemption, and Misery. And, you know, I immediately say, well, it depends on how you define horror, doesn't it? You know, what you're really saying is that they're not supernatural. Right. But that doesn't mean they're not horror. And if somebody says to me, the Shawshank Redemption, is it, it's not a horror story, and my immediate response is, says who? You, you, can you think of a more horrific circumstance than what Andy goes through in yeah, the Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption? Yeah, f f falsely imprisoned for 19 years. Much of his life robbed, living yeah. in this, this, inc this corrupt place that has him in its thrall. Um, I, really? Yeah, this isn't a horror story. I, I well, and misery is not a horror story. That's like saying Psycho isn't a horror story because it's not it's, because there's nothing supernatural about it. But of course it is. Uh, sometimes the greatest monsters are the human monsters, and Shawshank certainly says that. You know, Andy is is victimized throughout the film by the human monsters. So. Um, yeah, it is. You know, it, it, there's not a lot separating it. What I'm saying, you know, from Steve, the rest of Stephen King's work. Yeah. Um, it, and if you look at this as this film as some kind of of, of exception to the rule, uh, I think you're looking at it wrong because there's just one little shade that separates it from everything else that Stephen King has done. Okay, 
it, and do you think it's it just it's just lacking that supernatural element that is basically this very characteristic of Stephen King's works? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. you know, but but I also think that um, you know, horror is always about um, metaphor, and so it's always about certain intangibles, things that you can't put your your your, your fingers on. Uh, that stand for other things, and in the Shawshank Redemption, some of those intangibles are 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 things you can't put your hand on either. You can't hold friendship in your hand. You can't hold uh, the salvation in your hands. You ca- you can't hold uh, all of the 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 themes that are here. Those are intangibles too, and um, and they are the the magic that is behind what 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 saves Andy and Red. You know, uh, friendship uh, saves them. They save each other. And that's pretty powerful magic. Uh, that's, you know, and, and it may not be supernatural, but it's magic nonetheless. It, it, Mark, you've used uh, magic to describe uh, various a- aspects of the movie you know, I, 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 I was just going to say you know it's as we watch it for the first time or rewatch it for about you know the <laughs> like the 40th time um yeah it, it, it really is a perfect perfectly done movie um it, you know it, you know the casting is memorable. Yeah, like the uh, and, and like what you were say, saying, like the the the, the uh, friendship chemistry between Andy and Red is j- just draws people into the movie. Uh, the, the the other um, you know, characters were just or, you know, the other actors were uh, great choices by the you know, casting director. But you know, early on in your book, you're, you, know, you tell us that you know Frank, uh, the director, uh, really doesn't have much experience, you know, coming into this project. Uh, he's you know, introducing some ideas of characters that he wants to. Uh, uh, you know, play Andy and Red, and uh, uh, Red's uh, like inner circle of convicts uh, before Andy arrives. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, choices that Frank wanted to have for these characters. You know, how, how would they have changed? This nearly, uh, you know, basically a perfect film. Well, I think before you get to that, Mark, you have to get to the the real uh, the central point of why this film worked as well as it did. And I think the main reason is, I mean, because you have to remember that um, you're at Frank Darabont did not have uh, he had directed one TV movie at this point, and he was basically a screenwriter. Um, and Frank was a writer first, and I think that's one of the reasons. He did such a really, really good job adapting this was because mm-hmm. he he brought a writer's sensibility to this. And um, but, you know, he, it would never have happened if um, Frank, as a young, aspiring filmmaker, hadn't asked Stephen King permission to adapt a short story uh, called The Woman in the Room. And the woman in the room is was one of the stories that Stephen King had put into the bucket that he has for what he calls the dollar babies or the dollar deals. And these are uh, stories he makes available to young filmmakers to make for a dollar. That's that's all they have to pay. And then they can make a short film based on one of these short stories. And uh, the only uh, stipulation is King gets to decide uh when and how the the film might be made available uh, based on w- what was done. Uh, but it's an amazing thing for him to have done. It's one of the ways he gives back. 
and uh, a young Frank Darabont asked for the woman in the room. And what you have to know about the woman in the room is it's a deeply personal story. It's an early story of Stephen King's, and it's about his mother dying of cancer. And so it's a deeply personal story to Stephen King. And Frank Darabont asked permission to do it, and he produced a film that Stephen King still thinks is among the best adaptations of his work. So uh, if it had not been for the woman in the room, a few years later when Frank Darabont uh, comes calling and says he wants to make Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption into a movie, if there hadn't have been the woman in the room, I don't know that Stephen King would have said yes. And uh, even there, you know, because uh, there's an interview with Stephen King in the book uh, where he says, you know, um, he didn't think anybody could make a movie out of Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. He just didn't. And even if somebody did make a good screenplay out of it, he didn't think any studio would make it. Um, so he kind of said yes to Frank Darabont just to see if he could do it, I think, because he just had such grave doubts that anybody could have 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 done made that story into some kind of compelling screenplay. And then Frank Darabont delivered the screenplay and it knocked Stephen King out, but he still didn't think it was going to get made because he thought there's no studio. There, there, there's no action in this. It's, 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 a, it's, it, it's like a, a 1930s Warner Brothers prison movie. Who's going to make this movie? Well, the, the one place that would make it was Castle Rock. And I mean, the symbolism of this is just so incredible because – there wouldn't even be a Castle Rock if there hadn't have been for Stand By Me, the, the other movie that comes out of different seasons. The same book that, that Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption comes out, and Rob Reiner makes what is up to that point thought to be the best film from a Stephen King story. So Frank Darabont takes it to Castle Rock because of Stand By Me. And Castle Rock looks at it and says it's the best script they've ever seen. And yeah, they'll make it. And it's at that point that Rob Reiner steps forward and says, let me direct it. And Castle Rock says, let Rob direct it. And they offer Frank Darabont an incredible pile of money to step aside and let Rob Reiner direct it because Rob Reiner is a proven director at this point. He's already done Stand By Me, and Frank Darabont has no real credits. So they say, you know, let Rob direct it. You'll get the screenwriter's credit. He'll do a great job turning your screenplay into a movie, and, uh, and, and we'll give you change your life money to step aside. And it's at that point – now, how many of us <laughs> would have taken the money? I mean, this is change your life money. This is not just you know, uh, uh, you know, a weekend in Las Vegas money. This is big money. And Frank says no. You know, you can't defer your dream. He, he wants to direct it. And to their everlasting credit. Castle Rock and Rob Reiner say, okay, and then get behind him. Rob Reiner turns into the biggest mensch on the planet and becomes a mentor to Frank Darabont and helps him make the movie. How good is that? That's not going to happen at any other studio. That would have never happened at any other studio. They probably would have forced uh, Frank to give it up. They would have never let a uh, a neophyte director uh, with a movie this big. And they let him shoot it the way he wanted to. Now, when Rob Reiner was thinking about doing it, he had Tom Cruise uh, lined up to play Andy. And uh, there were a whole bunch of people considered for, for Red, including Harrison Ford and Clint Eastwood, just a bunch of people. Um, and Tom Cruise did not want to commit an f- entire film to a first-time director. Um, and he told Rob Reiner that. And Rob Reiner said, you know, you should do it. It's a great role. And Tom Cruise said, you know, that 
he would still do it if Rob Reiner would look over Frank Darabont's shoulder and make sure that he was doing things right. And Rob Reiner, to his everlasting credit, said, no, I won't do that to another director. And Tom Cruise walked away from it. Um, so, so, you know, and this is how it works. This is, this, this is how the magic works. It's all mystical, you know, that eventually, you know, the decision is made that Morgan Freeman, why don't we just blind cast him? Because the character is not black. And in, in, in Stephen King's story, he is a red haired, um, Irish American. And, um, they said, basically, let's, let's just get the best actor to do this. And so they give the role to Morgan Freeman. They don't change a line. They just, they, even the line where uh, he says, uh, you know, why do they call you red? And he says, maybe it's because I'm Irish. And he, but only he says it now with a certain amount of irony when he says the line, but it is, um, you know, they, they, and once they got Morgan Freeman, then they, you know, somebody thought about Tim Robbins. You know, Morgan Freeman says it was him who suggested uh, Tim Robbins. But whatever it was, I, 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 I submit to you, try to think about that movie without those two actors. Try to think of it without Morgan Freeman's narration. Try to think of it without uh, what Tim Robbins brings to the role of Andy, what Morgan Freeman brings. It's not the same movie. Um, and even though there's nothing wrong with the other actors who were involved, there's nothing wrong with a lot of the other people um, who were talking about. It's just that this movie works because of those two actors uh, primarily and the chemistry that they have with each other. And uh, it's just not the same movie. So, uh, you know, and that's one of the things about uh, this book. The story behind the story, you know, most movies, the story behind the story is not that interesting. Um, there might be a few good stories that come out of the making of a movie, but, you know, I mean, the story behind the story of the Shawshank Redemption is an endless succession of great stories. I did 70 interviews for this book, and everybody had a good story to tell, from Stephen King and Frank Darabont to you know, Tim Robbins to Clancy Brown to, to all the way down to somebody who just was who, who worked as an extra for a day. If you worked on the film, you had a great story to tell. Mm-hmm. And so I had this endless succession of wonderful stories. Um, and the other thing about this movie that um, that's very, very special uh, is that because they shot it on location, you know, most movies are shot on Hollywood sound stages. And when the movie is done and they wrap production, everything is just torn down. And there's no evidence that that movie was ever made, except what's on the screen. There's a script, there are stills, there are, you know, there are things that document it, but there's nothing physical that says, you know, th- th- this was the movie, this was where this was done. Um, and even movies that are shot on location, that's, that's again, because most movies don't spend that, that, that long on location. But the Shawshank Redemption shot 95% in Ohio, and it was shot in a succession uh, in a group of little towns in north central Ohio, um, Mansfield, Upper Sandusky, Ashland, and um, all of these locations are still there. So you can visit here. There is now a um, there is actually what is called the Shawshank Trail. It's 15 filming sites, and the crown jewel is the Ohio State Reformatory, which was Shawshank State Prison. And you can make a a visit to Ohio and visit and put your hand on these sets. The hotel where um, Brooks and Red stayed when they get out of prison, that's an actual building in downtown Mansfield. The bench in the park where Brooks fed the pigeons. Um, the the location where the, 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 the tree was stood. Um, All of these places you can visit and you can put your hand on it and you can make a physical connection to this film, which you can't do 
with most movies. Um, and when people come to visit, uh, when Shawshank fans come to, to Ohio to visit and visit these locations, it does have a sense of pilgrimage. It does seem to be a pilgrimage trail. Um, you see, see people that. with tears in their eyes. They're crying and they're um, because this this movie so profoundly okay, they connect to it in such a profound way. So I mean that's another part of it is that um, there was there were physical locations to go to and document. And I mean you want to stand in the warden's office and look at the safe. And look at the desk and the, where the window, where you know, uh, he, where, where he was his command post in the film. It's all there. It's all there inside the Ohio State Reformatory. Um, and so you know, you can you can walk the set. You can actually walk the set and put your hand on it. And you can't do that with movies. You know, if you, are you a Godfather fan? Where are you going to go? Are you a Forrest Gump fan? Where are you going to go? Maybe there's a place here or there, but Shawshank, ninety five. The only thing they did not shoot here is the one scene of Andy driving. Once he gets out of prison, there's a scene of Andy driving, um, right. and um, and then the last scene on the beach, which was shot uh, in Saint Croix, doubling for Zawatanejo, Mexico. Um, those are the only th- those are the only two scenes that they did not shoot here in Ohio. So I mean. Uh, the, uh, you know, that's why I say I have a very profound connection to this film too, because um, it 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 is coming out of here, and it it is in an area where um, I visit often, and I spent a good deal of last summer down there, doing research and collecting interviews. And um, another thing that made this book very very special is um, my daughter went with me. Um, Becky is a um, very gifted photographer and writer. Um, but she is a photography major at Kent State University, and um, this turned out to be her internship and senior project for Kent State. Uh, when I realized I was going to do an entire book on Shawshank, and I needed original pictures to go in the book along with the other uh, pictures that were in there, um, I basically asked Kent State, you know, well, Becky needs an internship. Can she be my intern? Can I get something out of this? Um, and they said, uh, yeah, that sounded like a really, really good idea. So, um, Becky went with me all during this time and there's about 55 pictures in the book and about 25 of them are, are, are pictures Becky took mm-hmm. last summer uh, as she documented this. So this was sort of a, a father, uh, a daughter odyssey as well. And it, it had to Story of the show, you're saying, you know, the prison is uh, basically one of the major characters in, you know, mm-hmm. the book. You know, you've been giving us a lot of, uh, you know, how, how much was filmed in like the prison yard, and, um, you know, some of the scenes from the movie seem like they would be filmed at other locations but yeah you're yeah you tell us that there's actually uh some of the scenes were uh like uh is is it uh red and brooks's hotel room was actually filmed at the prison and, and then we could get into uh the the uh, Portland Daily uh, Bugle scene was that that was actually a prison uh, uh, shot as well. And no, 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 no. You got, you got that. Uh, this is how it happened. Let me back that up a little bit because again, okay. this is, it is not there's not a part of this this, this story that is not. A, a good story, you know, and, okay. and you're right. The Ohio State Reformatory is one of the stars of the film. You know, one of the things they had to do was just like you had to cast just the right people for the actors and you had to find just the right. So you had to find a Bob Gunton to play the warden or a Clancy Brown to play Byron Hadley. They had to find and cast the prison perfectly. Mm-hmm. And um, and this again, you know, the the, uh, the head of the Ohio Film Commission, who I mentioned before, Eve Lapola. Um, 
the Ohio State Reformatory was not an active prison at that point. It had been uh, it, it had been shut down a couple of years before, and there was a new prison very close to it. Um, and in its end days, the, the Ohio State Reformatory was built in the 1890s, and it was a model prison. It was a whole community, and it was based on the idea of being a reformatory, teaching people a craft, to be a trade. And, 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 and being reformed was a big part of what the, that prison started out to be. In its end days, it was overcrowded. It was old. It was a hellhole in its last days. Um, but they had this big empty prison, and it was this incredible Gothic structure. And um, Eve had found out that they were they were looking for one, so she went to a, a, an exhibition in Los Angeles where uh, all the film commissions uh, and uh, meet in a big exposition hall. And directors and producers go around and they meet with the different film commissions. And she had brought a whole lot of uh, information with her and pictures of the Ohio State Reformatory. And Frank Darabont and his producer, Nikki Marvin, came by the table and she showed them uh, the Ohio State Reformatory. And um, they were, as anybody is who's ever just stood in front of that building, they were knocked out just by the pictures. Um, so it came down to two prisons. They had it narrowed down to two, one in Tennessee and, uh, and the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield. So um, they took it, David Lester, the producer, Nikki Marvin, uh, producer Frank, and Terrence Marsh, um, the production designer. They, they went on a scouting trip in March of 1993 and the first place they stopped was Mansfield they went to the Ohio State Reformatory first and it was a cold winter day in Ohio it was one of those March days when Ohio when winter just refuses to let go there was snow drifts outside the prison there were snow drifts inside the prison um, it was it was cold and it was miserable and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. They knew that this was Shawshank when they saw it. Um, and they went on to the Tennessee prison, but um, they kind of knew. But in the back of his mind, Frank lodged away the Tennessee prison, and that's the prison he used in the Green Mile. So he did, oh. the Tennessee prison did get used eventually. Um, so he just lodged it away and said, uh -uh, you know, I can use that someday. And he did. Um, but once they had seen the Tennessee prison, they they called back um, the head of the um, tourism uh, and uh, growth uh, the destination Mansfield organization, a fellow by the name of Lee Tassif, who had shown them through the prison. And uh, David Lester called Lee and said, we're going to bring you the movie uh, under one condition. You have to find us a warehouse that's big enough to build a prison cell set, a, a cell block, a whole cell block, three tiers. And the reason was they knew immediately when they went through the cell blocks of the Ohio State Reformatory, which are huge, there was no way to control light and sound in there. Um, and the other problem was Frank wanted uh, a look of facing cell blocks. If you remember the movie, the cell block that Andy and Red are incarcerated in has facing cells. And that is not what the cells are like inside the Ohio State Reformatory. So they wanted to build a cell block, which would be a functioning set in town. And there was a Westinghouse warehouse, which was big enough to accommodate it. And um, so Terrence Marsh designed, it was a work, it was a work of wonder is what it was. He designed a completely functioning cell block, and a, con the head, a fellow by the name of Sebastian Melito actually built it. And this thing looks so realistic that everybody just assumed that they shot those scenes in a real prison. I did. Well, the, the truth is that was 
uh, a set they built in this warehouse in Mansfield. And um, under any other, and on any other film, Terrence Marsh would have won an Academy Award for that cell block. But everybody just assumed, like you did, that it was a real prison. So it was too good for its own good. And, and nobody it didn't get the credit at the time for having been this incredible work of, of film magic. And it, they actually had hydraulics that worked. I mean, if you look, if you look at any scene in the movie that was shot in the cell block, it was shot at, uh, in, in that warehouse. All the other scenes were shot at the prison. You know, you know, everything else was shot. All the prison yard scenes were shot there. The warden's office, um, the cafeteria scenes, um, all of those scenes, the solitary scenes, everything else was shot at the Ohio State Reformatory. The, uh, the one thing that was not shot there was the cell block scene. Now, they also needed other places, um, and among them was the, 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 they needed was a really – interesting looking building to serve as the Brewer Hotel, which is this sort of halfway hotel where James Whitmore's character Brooks stays when he gets out of prison and Morgan Freeman's character Red stays when he gets out of prison. They they found that building in downtown Mansfield. It's called the Bisman Building and it's uh, it, it goes back to the 1880s. They put an awning on the building to make it look more like a hotel. But it's not a hotel. So the interior of the Bisman building was not used for the hotel scenes, only the exteriors. So where is that room where Red and Brooks stay when they get out of prison? It's back in the prison. It's, that's, that is inside the Ohio State Reformatory, and it's still there. If you want to see Brooksy's room, it's still there. They had this nice big space, which was off the chapel area, and it was big enough to put a room in there, to build a room. So they built the hotel room set in the prison. And then they used the ground floor of the Bisman building, which is the hotel, for the editor's office at the end for the Portland Daily Bugle. So the Portland Daily Bugle is inside the Bisman building, which is used as the hotel, and the hotel room is back up at the prison. Now, symbolically, that's pretty good. You know, because when James Whitmore's character gets out of prison, he goes to that, that awful hotel and that awful room. And symbolically to know that that room is actually up in the prison, and we all know that Brooks never gets out of prison. He's physically out of prison, but he's not out of prison. He's still trapped. And the symbolism of that room actually being in the prison is powerful. And it's also somewhat startling because when you take a tour of the prison now and you're walking through, all of a sudden you're standing in Brooksy's room. It's like, wait, 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 you know, <laughs> it, 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 it is almost a disconnect for a second. And then you realize like, wow, that's here. That's, that, that's here inside the Ohio State Reformatory. So the irony there is they did not shoot the prison uh, blocks, block scenes at the prison. But they did shoot the hotel room scenes there, so so that's what you were referring to, right? It is the the um, uh, beam with red was here and you know, yep. Brooks was here. Is is you know, is that a prop or is that it's still there? It they built that beam. They put the beam up there and um, then they tore it out. Oh. Um, so, uh, so an identical beam has been put back. So when you tour the prison, um, it's there. You see it there, but it is not the original beam from the movie. Um, it, it, but it, but uh, the space for it was there. So they just, they, they just put an identical beam back with the words, if I didn't tell you that, you wouldn't know it, um, because it looks exactly the way it looks in the movie. And uh, I mean, you can walk into the room. You just walk right into the room, and uh, you're there. You know, so it is. Uh, uh, like I said, that's one of the amazing things about this. Uh, and, and it also speaks to the, the cell block. It's it's like everything is a good story. Everything about this is a good story. It's like the tree. You know, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they we have needed to get into to find, that. They needed to find the tree. And uh, there's a great guy who I interviewed for, for this book, among many great guys and great people. But um, the person who was in charge of scouting locations was uh, a, a very colorful fellow by the name of Kokai Ampha, who had worked on a lot of movies at that point. And uh, it, it was him and his team's responsibility to find the locations and uh, in some cases to clean up the locations or to make sure they look good. And they knew they had to find a tree, and they knew it had to be in that area. Uh, so, you know, they went looking, and, and Kokai didn't find the tree. It was one of the people on his, um, on his team that found it. And um, it was in an alfalfa field on, a pri- on private property. And uh, it was exactly the look they were looking for, that incredible tree. Uh, but they also needed uh, that rock wall. Uh, so you know, you, you pay for your picture. The end of the film when Red goes out to the tree, mm-hmm. he finds the rock wall, and that's where he finds the uh, the little tin that Andy has buried for him to find and dig up. Well, the tree was there, and the tree was magnificent, but the rock wall wasn't. They built that. The film crew built that. Sebastian Melito, again, the same guy who built the um, the cell block. He built the rock wall and they put it they 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 put it there i mean it looks like when you see it in the movie it looks like a rock wall that's been there for a hundred years um but in truth it was only built for the movie now um here's the sort of the the backstory to that you know you had they have this wonderful shawshank trail where you can go see all these you can go to the bisman building you can go to the park where Brooks fed the pigeons. You can go to the prison. You can go to the cabin where uh, it opens, where um, uh, Andy's wife and the golf pro, Glenn Quentin, are carrying on. Uh, You can go to the courthouse in Upper Sandusky, which was the courthouse that they used. And go into the actual courtroom where Andy is convicted of killing his wife and her lover. Uh, You can go to the wood shop in Upper Sandusky that they used for the prison wood shop. You can go to all these places. You can stand in all these places. Um, and the one place that a lot of people want to see is, you know, the, uh, the warehouse and that, that cell block set. Well, the film crew tore it all down. And it was for legal reasons. When first off, they were renting the warehouse, and one of the stipulations was they put everything back the way it was so it could continue being a warehouse for the owners. But even if that were not the case, they would have still torn down the cell block set because a film company cannot leave a standing set behind because if anybody gets injured on it later on, you're legally liable for that. So heartbreakingly, they tore down the cell block set, every bit of it. And they took it right down to the floor, and there was nothing left of it when they left town. And they tore down the rock wall too, because the rock wall they had to put that back. That was a that was you know a farm that was yielding crops, and uh, so they had to put that back the way they found it too. So the rock wall was removed, uh, and the cell block set was removed, and then a few, many years after that. The entire warehouse was torn down. So even if people who want to go by and see the warehouse where they film the scenes, there's nothing to see. There's just a big lot there. You have to use your imagination if you want to think about what it was like when they were actually filming there. Um, And the tree tragically came down a few years ago. Um, There's a myth that um, the tree was struck by lightning, and that's what brought it down. That's not true. Uh, Windstorms brought the tree down. And it would have come down eventually anyway because the tree was so old, ants were eating it from the inside out. And that's what weakened it, so the windstorms took it down. Um, So people still go out to the site of where the tree was. It's almost just as profound to them. They want to know where it was and where it stood. But uh, the rock wall was gone immediately, and and nature did the rest as far as taking the tree down. Okay. More when okay, so we have uh, 
yeah, good, good understanding of the you know layout of the town and you know the form being out, you know, away, away from the uh, prison. Yeah, you, know, you also devote um, so some of your book to you know really analyzing the characters you know you need to spend a little bit of time uh doing that and you know we, and you, know, you were just uh talking a little bit about uh brooks um yeah he's he he doesn't have a you know a lot of on screen Time, but James Whitmore just leaves such a uh, presence in, in that film that uh, you know deeply uh, uh, affects all the characters. Um, it, it, it just seems like he's the worst case scenario that could happen if you ever get paroled. It, it, you know, what did, role did uh, James Whitmore play besides being just a really nice guy and mentor to all the people on, on the set with his uh, stories of his lengthy career? But, yeah, and I, I think it's just the fact that um, – you know, because, because in the book, um, there is a, ca- a character named Brooks, but um, – Basically, he's not the way he is in the movie, and 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 there are two characters who kind of are used to uh, uh, as somewhat the the origins of the Brooks character, but Darabont really created um, a, a much different uh, type of character and used the character in a, in a much different way than Stephen King does in the book, and. Um, you know, you, you needed an actor who had the gravitas of a James Whitmore. You needed somebody who could basically give you an awful lot without saying a lot, that it's all on the face. I mean, you know, there's, there's these wonderful scenes uh, are, that are just close-ups on that incredible face of James Whitmore, and he's telling you everything you need to know, uh, like the scene on the bus when he's leaving uh, Shawshank prison and it's taking him towards the town. Um, and is that those, those incredible close-ups? Uh, you, you really do need that kind of an actor uh, who's bringing you and, and, and also somebody you have to believe really has been in prison all those years. And uh, Whitmore just had that face and that quality so that later on, when Red is saying to people, you know, um, that he was institutionalized, you know, even before Brooks gets out, and when he holds the knife to, to Hayward's throat, and he, he yeah he goes crazy because he's going to get out, and he he doesn't want to leave. He, he the only thing he knows is prison, and 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 he, they say, you know, what 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 happened in there, and Red says, you know, it's uh, he's. He's become institutionalized, you know, that these walls are funny, you know, first you hate them, then you, you know, you get to depend on them and then they're the only thing, you know, and that's institutionalized. And, uh, Whitmore isn't even in the scene. Whitmore is not even in that scene, but he hangs over that scene. That's all you can think about. That's all you can see is Brooks in that scene as red saying that. And you're right. I mean, he is the example. Uh, you know, Red says at one point, you know, they they send you here for life, and that's what they take, the part that counts anyway. And that's, um, you know, uh, it, it's just, uh, you, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that James Whitmore is playing that part, we wouldn't feel it as deeply as we do. And, um, you know, you mentioned that... Um, what James Whitmore brought to the, the set as a, you know, as a presence because, um, he, he, you know, he was suffering from arthritis at the time. 
So he wasn't getting around very well. And they had a lot of scenes where he's climbing the steps to get to his room. He's got, you know, there were a lot of, you know, walking around town. And I, and I have to tell you that, you know, that, you know, uh, nobody, nobody can remember that summer. And that, that, that three month shoot with remembering the heat, even for a summer in Ohio, that was a brutally hot summer. Um, and the first thing people, even people who weren't in the film and people still talk about the summer of 93 and how incredibly brutally hot it was. And, um, and Whitmore was such a trooper, you know, he never complained. He'd always give them another take. He'd always do it again. Um, but, you know, one of the things that um, when I asked for endorsements to the book, for the book, blurbs for the book, one of the people who, who gave me just a, just a wonderful, terrific blurb was Clancy Brown, uh, who plays Byron Hadley. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that Clancy said was that in addition to everything else, the book was, uh, was almost like a tutorial on how film crews should act on location. And that is really, really true. This was a great film crew. Um, they left behind a lot of friends and a lot of memories. And they did as little disruption to the area as they could. And they also had a whole lot of great ambassadors within the film. Um, hey, that, 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 that came across in, yeah. in your book. It just how, how many just local people you – who were in in the movie? You know, you it spoke to him about it, and, and and everyone just had something you know really positive to say about you know working with this person, this lady. Yeah, I got the uh, dog story. Oh yeah, as as well. I mean, it's like you know, the movie's about hope and friendship. But but that's what is like the real life legacy of the movie. You know, we just had um, a few weeks ago, uh, the weekend of August 16th, 17th, and 18th was the big <clears throat> Shawshank um, reunion event, uh, 25th anniversary reunion event uh, in Mansfield. And uh, Frank Darabont came in for it. And it's the first time he'd come back. Since 93, he had never been back here since 93. And uh, Bob Gunton was here and Gil Bellows who played Tommy. And um, just, uh, you know, uh, several of the cast members came back for it. Uh, Kokai Ampha was here. And um, it really was like old home week. It was really like this, this incredible, the bunny. We had uh, you know, thousands of fans from all over the world came in for it. The people who worked on the film came back, and then the people from the area who worked on the film were, were, were here. And it was like a – it really was like a big family picnic is what it was like. And, um, and, and I have to say that you know, even as, as, as warmly uh, as everybody felt towards most everybody who worked on the film, there were like three or four people who emerged as the favorites uh, a month. And, and and number one was Morgan Freeman because Morgan Freeman was just uh, you know everybody's favorite. He loved talking to people. Uh, Morgan's process, um, you know, he and Tim worked very very well together, but their process was different. Um, Tim is much more of a method actor, you know, and he had the much more difficult role. He was dealing with a character who was. Uh, you know, repressed his feelings and, 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 and was going through all this angst. And, um, and, and Tim, he, he, when he's in character, when he, when he works in character, he, he, he really, you know, he's, he's, he's very solitary. He just, you know, uh, uh, Morgan, he can be laughing and talking right up to the point where the director calls action and get into it just like, like, so like that. And just, he's, he's ready to go and it's perfect. He's perfect. You know, his process is different uh, from Tim's. And then again, they work together extraordinarily well. But because of that, and because Morgan loves to talk, I mean, loves to get to know people. You know, he's constantly, he was constantly talking to people. And there's always a rule on movie sets. If you're an extra, if you're doing anything on, on, on the movie, 
you do not talk to the star unless they talk to you first. Well, that was never a problem with Morgan Freeman because he was talking to everybody. He was talking to the makeup people. He's talking to the person in the next makeup chair. He's talking to the per- people who were in the scenes with him. And he would s- say to them, you know, like, well, what's your story? Tell me about yourself. Oh, you know, and, you know, he went to church in his area and he brought his horses with him. They, you know, he, they put him up at a, he had a, a, a rented house with a stable and he could bring his riding horses with him. So, you know, uh, he had picnics uh, out, at his house and, you know, everybody loved Morgan, you know, on, on this, on, on this shoot and, you know, coming in close behind Morgan was probably, uh, uh, Bill Sadler who played Haywood, Clancy Brown, who played Byron Hadley and Bob Gunton who played the warden. And, um, isn't that, am- isn't that amazing that the two of the biggest villains in the, in the piece, uh, <laughs> the warden and Byron Hadley are played by two of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. And that, that is, that is really, really true. Uh, Cause Clancy Brown and Bob Gunton are just like two, two great, great guys. And in the early stages of filming, he also mentioned Susan Sarandon being there just uh, you know, to support her husband, but uh, you know, all, all the people who are cast to be in, in you know, the uh, jury and um, in the um, attendance of the trial, like they were just amazed that she was there, and she, you know, she she was very uh, gracious to talk with uh, the, them in between all the shoots. So you know, like, oh, yeah. it, it, it just continued for you know, you know uh, big name stars who weren't even part of the movie, uh, uh, other than she was just there on vacation uh, with her husband. Well, you've you got to remember that um, it was a long shoot, and and so you know Tim was here for three months. They also got him a house. Um, it was actually a house that belonged to a, a Seventh Day Adventist dentist. And, um, you know, so he had this house where he could stay, uh, and so, and he had two little boys, so he and uh, Susan Sarandon and and the boys could, uh, you know, have more of an actual home life because it is, I mean, it's a three month shoot. That's a, that's a low, you're not going to stay in a hotel uh, for, although a lot of people did stay at the holiday inn or the Mansfield inn or whatever, um, but the 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 bigger name people uh, got, they got them houses, um, so they could you know so for Morgan it was a it was a case of you know so he could get a ride in because it's how he that was his therapy that's how he stayed sane was to to get in a ride at the end of the day, um, you know with Tim it was like being able to have a place for his for 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 uh, Susan Sarandon and and the boys, um, and they too would have people come out and. Uh, um, uh, play pickup basketball games, or you know, or, or or softball games, or whatever. It really was like a, um, you know, because there's a lot of downtime on films, and uh, so the extras and the, the guards and the and the people who worked on the film, the people in the community and the, and the actors, they you know they 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 did kind of bond throughout all of this. Um, you know, Clancy Brown remembers that he and Larry. Uh, Bradenburg, who played one of uh, Red's inner circles, they they had a house together, um, and uh, they basically it was like a a, a a boy's summer for them. They you know they weren't in a lot of scenes. They had a lot of downtime. So you know as Clancy said, you know they they watched a lot of baseball. They watched Shooting Stars at night. They drank a lot of beer and had a great time. <laughs> you know so you know, Clancy remembers it as a as a, as a great shoot. Um, you know, a lot of fun. So, it 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 really was a happy film. Is what I'm saying is that you know there there are people will say you know this was a happy shoot and you look into it and you find out you know where the pro and it's not to say there wasn't a lot of artistic pulling and shoving around the edges. There was um, because this was Frank's first um, film, and one of the reasons Tim Robbins agreed to do the film was uh, he had just directed his first movie. And he knew how important your cinematographer was 
especially for a first time director, but for anybody, your cinematographer is, is really, really, really a crucial person uh, to have. And because this was Frank's first movie, Tim asked for approval on the cinematographer. And uh, fortunately, the person he brought in was Roger Deakins who is one of the legendary cinematographers. Uh, you know, so, so you, you, know, you look up Roger Deakins name and you see Oscar behind it. Um, so they brought in Deakins who was um, a real contributor to the movie. And he also had a, a different way of filming than Frank, you know, uh, Roger Deakins believed that you spent all your, your time planning the shot. So that when you actually did the shot, you did it very fast. You could do it very, very quickly. And most of your time should be spent planning. Frank believed in a lot of takes. Uh, Tim and Morgan will tell you too many takes. And he probably did overshoot a little bit uh, because, you know, he was a first-time director. And, you you know, as a first-time director, you want to be sure you have it. You know, you don't, you, you, you don't quite have the confidence that you have later on. Um, so you had some really, really good people where, you know, Terry Marsh, we've already talked about, you know, as the, as the production designer, brilliant, brilliant, uh, you know, artist. So you had Terry Marsh, you had Roger Deakins, you had, uh, you know, F Frank Darabont. Uh, and then you had, you know, two great actors who had also directed in Morgan Freeman and, and Tim Robbins. And from this, there was, you know, there was certainly a little pulling and shoving around the edges around, you know, how to do a scene or how many times you do a take or how it should be done. But from all of this, a better film emerged because they all learned from each other. And they all, you know, they, they all contributed something to the stew that became Shawshank Redemption. So you have this, you know, uh, collaboration. I mean, you hear that film is collaboration. Mm -hmm. Boy, is it. <laughs> and uh and, and Shawshank is one of the I mean and it, when it's all done when when you it's all done it, you know the editors who worked on this film it's an editor's masterpiece this film you want to study great editing look at the Shawshank redemption and then the music then you add Newman's music to this um and Mozart's it, music what's that and you know Mozart yes the uh, the marriage of Figaro uh but but you know you add in uh you know there are like there's Hank Williams there's the marriage of Figaro there's a few other uh, but for the most part you know most of the music that you hear is that incredible score uh you know that that just you know just wonderful wonderful uh uh music by Thomas Newman and Every that's why I say you know the, the people who worked on this movie, um, and then you will go, go all the way back to the source material. You go all the way back to the, that that you know that none of this happens, none of this works without uh, without Stephen King's original story. So you know the, the the people who work on this movie, you know, you start making a list. You've got incredible craftsmen working on this. You've got incredible artists. Uh, Stephen King, Frank Darabont, Terry Marsh, Roger Deakins. I mean, that's that's uh, Thomas Newman. I mean, it's, it's an incredible uh, collection of talent working on this movie. And, and you know, you know, we've d discussed uh, the symbolism of uh, James Whitmore's uh, Brooks. And you also look at um, – you know, we can also look at the uh, symbolism of the uh, uh, tarring the uh, – a, a woodshed uh, roof, and you, know, you bring our attention to you – know, like, it, in that scene where you know you kind of get you know, the impression of uh you get the twelve disciples there but yeah there there are elements that Andy is a christ like figure but he's not yeah you know, not totally a christ like figure and all the 
uh, you know, roofs of the actual prison are all pointing up. It's, you know, there's a, a lot of other imagery in that movie that uh, it goes with concepts of hope that you know, you know we may not think about, but when you read your book, you know, you're you know, drawing our attention to it and t- tying all that together. It, you know, can, can we talk you know, for a little bit about that kind of symbolism of, of some of these characters and scenes? Sure. You know, Shawshank Redemption is the type of movie that the more you look for, the more you're going to find. And that's why another reason it, it, it really uh, invites repeat viewing, um, because you can see a scene and you can say to yourself that, uh, you know, uh, Wow, you know, the, I mean, like the, the symbolism of, of uh, Andy crawling through that um, that 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 awful tunnel, you know, uh, so the length of five football fields uh, to come out clean at the other end. And when he gets out, you know, there's that incredible scene where the lightning is forking all about, and he puts his arms out and reaches his arms up. And people have said that, you know, it. Um, it's the moment that seems that's most Christ-like in symbolism because it almost seems like a crucifixion symbol. And yet it's not. I mean, it's, this is the moment of, if anything, resurrection. It's the moment of, of, of uh, mm-hmm. salvation. It's the moment that he gets out. And, you know, so it's one of those things where you can look at that scene and say, is it one? Is it both? Is it neither? Is it, you know, it, it's, you can go through, uh, so many aspects of this film and it's there, there, there's so much that's in the dialogue there's so much that's in the, the way things are shot there's even things in, in in aspects of this film that you don't see or you you don't know notice unless you're told to notice it's like the 12 disciples on the roof um and i didn't notice that you know, another uh, uh shawshank uh, uh researcher noticed that uh, who had written a book about it in England. And, uh, and, and, you know, I would have never noticed that. Um, you know, you certainly notice the scene where, you know, Haywood goes over and Andy does not partake of the, of the drink. Uh, he says, no, you know, I gave up drinking. Um, you know, so, uh, but if you look at it, at this, this movie, like there's, you know, one of the things that, um, the themes of this movie that that's obviously very, very powerful is redemption. Um, but the Christian concept of redemption is that you can't earn it. Uh, the Christian concept of redemption is it is yours for the asking. Um, it is yours for the, the acceptance and the asking, and it is given you. Um, with that come certain obligations, but you know you don't earn redemption in in true Christian theology. Um, this movie actually says you know uh, it believes in hope and redemption, but it also stresses the fact that you have to pursue the correct avenues to get there. One of them is education. Look how much this movie stresses education. What mm-hmm. does Andy do in order to you know, pass time and to make the best of his time and to atone for whatever he may view his, his sins being? He's um, reading. He builds a library. Mm-hmm. He makes the best prison library. He is reading, but he is also encouraging other people to educate themselves. He is giving a high school equivalency tests to other prisoners so they can better themselves. Look at how much is stressed on education. Look how much is stressed on music, that the arts and uh, music can be a way of leading you to redemption. Um, Not just reading and literature, but also how much is stressed on music in this when he plays the marriage of Figaro over and everybody stops and it becomes this beatific moment in the film 
And he says afterwards, there are places they can't get at you. Don't you feel that way about music? Don't you feel that way about, you know, and um, that music can be Hank Williams or it can be Mozart. So, so there are all of these, these, these images in the movie and these moments of movies that talk about redemption, but they also talk about the passages that you have to pursue. And sometimes that's education. Sometimes it's the arts. Um, I mean, now think about this one. You know the scene where um, uh, they are showing Gilda, uh, the Rita Hayworth movie, right, in prison, and Andy comes to Red and asks him to get uh, get him Rita Hayworth. You know, we find out later he's talking about the poster, um, but he said he goes in and says, "Can you get me Rita Hayworth?" And Red says, "Yeah, it'll take me a couple of weeks, but yeah, I can get her." Um, well, that scene was shot in a room in the prison. Um, it wasn't the main chapel uh, room. It was, it's a, it was a room in the upstairs of the prison, which is just called the Jesus Room. It was actually the Episcopal, uh, the, I mean the Protestant chapel uh, at the prison. And um, the projection and, – and it's called the Jesus Room because on one wall there is this mural of Christ, and the projection booth is behind that wall. So when you see that scene, the movie is actually being projected through the body of Christ onto the screen. Hmm. And it's the image of Rita Hayworth, and Rita Hayworth is going to become the image of Andy's salvation. Now think about that for a second. You're not even aware of that when you're watching the movie. Right. I'm not even sure you can see it in the movie. I'd have to go back and really play with the color adjustments. I mean, I've been in that room and seen where the projection room is and seen where the hole is and seen where the mural of, of Christ is and all of that. But the truth is, I mean, the truth is the, the image of Rita Hayworth is being projected through um, the body of, of Christ. and. And I don't want to get too heavy with the symbolism here, uh, you know, of this movie, but you asked. And um, here is the movies. The movies are transformative, too. And the movie and a movie and what movie can be more about redemption and salvation than the Shawshank Redemption? So, yes, reading in books and libraries. Yes, music and Mozart and Hank Williams, but yes, movies too. Movies are an art form as well, and movies can save you as well. And how many people have told me that this movie saved them? I'm saved sure them heard that. time and time again. Yep. And so, you know, but there's an aspect to that movie that, again, people aren't even aware of. You know, and and I tell them that, and I when I tell them, that, I say, you know. You, the movie's actually being projected through a mural uh, uh, in, in what was a chapel, a mural of Christ, and it just blows their mind you know, when I say that to them. Um, but I say, you know, that's – you know, um, and, and, and it really speaks to how much influenced this movie, how many different things influenced this movie. Um, certainly, you know, um, there is a moral um, – uh, backbone to this movie, um, and but you know, this, but there's everything that influenced Stephen King, but there's everything that that influenced Frank Darabont as well. And one of Frank Darabont's favorite movies is "It's a Wonderful Life." And it's hard to think about "It's a Wonderful Life" and 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 the Shawshank Redemption in the same uh, breath. But the truth is, you know, they are both movies about. Um, about finding your way and keeping hope alive. Um, if that's not what George Bailey is doing in It's a Wonderful Life, I don't know what it is. So um, I, I think you have, you know, a lot of that kind of DNA. You know, another one of the great influences on on Frank is, you know, something else we've talked about before is the Twilight Zone. Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone are, you know, uh, profound profound influences on Frank Darabont and his work. And Rod Serling is one of his heroes. So 
you know, you you also see that in the Shawshank Redemption, uh, the kind of uh, cautionary tale, moral parable that Broad Serling liked to tell. And that very much informs uh, the Shawshank Redemption as well. So, you know, all of this, and, you know, you also go back to, you know, uh, you know th- that all works on a very lofty level, what we're talking about. And it's all there. I mean, you know, it, it is all there. You know, the redemption, salvation, hope, um, just how, the, you know, retribution to evildoers. I mean, you know, the, the payoff to... Uh, uh, what happens to 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 Byron Hadley and 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 Warden Norton at the end, and to Boggs, uh, the prison rapist? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, bad things happen to bad people in in this movie. That's very much the Twilight Zone, um, where you know you tr- where evil people uh, walking around the Twilight Zone have a target on them, and they're going to get hit by a bolt of cosmic justice. So um, that's another you know aspect of this movie. But then, you know, sort of leaving that kind of level behind and, and bringing this down to sort of the, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, a level that I, where I do really do think it appeals is something we've talked about is friendship. And the slowly developing and deepening friendship between Red and Andy, um, I, you know, it's hard to find that in movies. It's hard to find that in, in any movies especially with men. Friendship that's usually depicted between men in movies is usually of the buddy variety. It's sort of the mm-hmm. lethal weapon, you know, high action, good buddy variety. There aren't very many picture, movies that actually look at, you know, a really mature um, friendship. And I think that's one of the appeals of the movie too, is that it, and again, it doesn't have to be a male to male friendship. It can be any kind of friendship where, you know, there's somebody who you've depended on, somebody who was there for you. And, you know, and remember too, is that, um, I, you know, one of the, you know, I, I, I the, 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 the work I, I most compare this movie too is the grapes of wrath because I believe it is becomes our, our grapes of wrath. I believe the Shawshank redemption has become our generation's grapes of wrath. It is the movie about keeping hope alive under desperate circumstances. And I think that that's um, w- one of the reasons that the movie has grown in its appeal. But um, another work of, uh, of literature, American literature that there are comparisons to is, you know, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. Um, you know, Huckleberry Finn is basically about two people who are being beset upon by all angles of society. And they mm-hmm. find salvation in the friendship with each other. That's a good and point. And they save each other. You know, they save each other. They're not they, – they, it's not like one is, 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 is more important than the other or is less. They – as a matter of fact – the part of the magic of that book is 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 the acceptance of each other as equals at a time when society would have said they weren't uh they say we are and uh in the same way um andy and red save each other mm-hmm. but if it's not for red andy's not going to survive shawshank and 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 in return andy gives red the ability to believe in hope. And so you, you, you know, they save each other. Um, and you don't have sort of a magic, uh, individual in all of this. You have, you have, uh, that, and that's what friends do. That that's what real friends do. So I, I think that that's part of the appeal of the film. Um, you, maybe you have a friend like Andy or red, and if you don't, you'd sure want one, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. It, it, and, it, you know, Mark, we have like 20 minutes. You know, so it's, it, I think your explanation and, and, and interpretations are great. I just, you know, just want to make sure we 
you know, kind of cover you know so, so, some other things. We you know, need to plug your uh, upcoming appearances as well. But you know, speaking of this, yeah, like the Twilight Zone ish uh, wrapping up of you know the Shawshank Redemption, yeah, you know, the morality. Um, it, it it seems like when Andy goes to all the banks and makes the withdrawals. He, he's, uh, if I'm remembering Red's um, voiceover, it, it, Andy didn't take all of uh, Warden Norton's money. It was just like for the 19 years compensation. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he, you know, he doesn't really say. He says all toll Andy uh, Blue Town with, and then he gives a figure of Warden Norton's money. So the implication is that there there's more money out there. Um, you know, and and the book is different. The the book is different because it's not Warden Norton's money that uh, he gets in the in the book. Um, and and there are four different wardens in the book. In the in the book. Uh, you know, what Frank Darabont basically did was to have some continuation is that he had one one warden and one captain of the guard. So he, he basically rolled several characters into who, what became Warden Norton and Byron Hadley. Uh, but uh, so the, 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 there's there's different aspects of the wardens that be, that are all – he took sort of the worst of all the wardens and made them Warden Norton uh, in the movie. And uh, – but the the movie is different, you know. Andy uh, has actually uh, invested money. Had a friend outside invest money, and he can't touch it. He can't get to it. So um, it, it's you know he has this this. But that's a different. That's something else that Frank Darabont changed. Um, you know, there there's a lot. I one there's there's a whole chapter in the book of the differences between um, Stephen King's story and Frank Darabont's screenplay. And even though the general uh, tenor of the story is the same, there's a lot of little differences. Um, you know, for instance, you know, well, we start with the description is that, you know, uh, Red is a uh, uh, an Irish American and, and Andy is a short guy. He's not tall, drink of water, as like Tim Robbins is described and shown in the movie. Um also, Andy drinks in the movie, in the book, uh, twice a year. He On his birthday and I think New Year's, I can't remember, there's two occasions where he buys a bottle of bourbon from Red, and he only has like you know one or two drinks, and then he gives the, the rest of the, the bourbon to the other inmates to have. Um, so there are the, all these little subtle differences between uh, Stephen King's story and Frank Darabont's screenplay. Uh, which are sort of fun to note, but you also get to see how Frank took all that basic DNA, storytelling DNA, and turned it into uh, this movie that we all love. And uh, and again, I think one of the reasons is because Frank was is a writer first. You know, I, I really do think that's the whole secret to why he was able to to and and not just the Shawshank Redemption. Remember that if you know. If you were making a list of the five best movies made from Stephen King's work, um, and that's a highly subjective list, I grant you. But if you were to make that kind of a list, you might start with uh, The Shawshank Redemption, um, Stand By Me, Misery, The Green Mile, and The Mist. And all five of those films are made by two directors. They're made by Rob Reiner. Or Frank Darabont. Um, so you have two directors who seem to have the magic touch when it comes to uh, adapting Stephen King, which does not mean there are not other really, really good adaptations of Stephen King's work. You know, by the time the Shawshank Redemption came along in 1994, it had already hardened into myth that Hollywood. You just always butchered Stephen King's work. You know, they say, oh, there's just a bunch of, and that wasn't true. Even then, that wasn't true. There were some really good movies in that that, that pile. Maybe not as good as the Shawshank Redemption, 
the dead zone looks better and better every year. Yeah, r- 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 right, right. I forgot that one. Yeah. Yeah, the dead zone is was a, was a good movie when it came out, and and David Cronenberg did a good job with it, and it, it and it even and it looks better now than it did then. Uh, Creep Show, you know, it doesn't try to be this, you know, uh, epic. A horror film, it's, it, but for what it is, a tribute to the old uh, Tales from the Crypt EC comics, it's 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 a wonderful movie, extremely enjoyable. There's nothing wrong with Creepshow. It's a it's it, it's 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 a really nice little movie. Um, so the the notion that nobody that people always missed with Stephen King was not true then, and you know and and it's become less true. Um, but it is certainly true that certain filmmakers seem to really have the feel for adapting Stephen King. And uh, certainly there are no two better examples of it than Frank Darabont and Rob Reiner. So um, I, I, I think that that's, you know, that would be true whether they were making something that was supernatural or whether there were no supernatural elements in it. And um, I think they've demonstrated it both ways. Okay. It, yeah, we have to address a character who never appears in the movie, uh, but he's only mentioned. Uh, uh, where did the name Randall Stevens come from? I have no idea. As a matter of fact, I would change it. Because in the I, I think in in in, in Stevens' uh, story it's Peter Stevens. I'm not, oh. I'd have to look this up, but but they changed it for some reason. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, you, you could 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 take a lot of guesses. You know, this is the 25th anniversary of the Shawshank Redemption, but it's also the 25th anniversary of the miniseries version of The Stand, and there's Randall Flagg in that, and that's the same year. Uh, as this, I but I, I have no idea why he changed that. Um, I, I, I and I and I didn't ask him in my interviews with him, uh, okay. but I have no idea. But but I, but I'm but I'm reasonably sure it was Peter Stevens in the in in the book. And uh, <laughs> it, 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 I, I I don't I I don't know. I just I just, just yeah. want to throw the question out. I just yeah. uh, thought maybe. I, I, it, no, no. I, I guess just because it sounded like a, you know, like anything else, it's, you know. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, and and so many things, you know. Um, it's it's it, you know it's it, it's why Bram Stoker, you know, called his book Dracula and why he said it in Transylvania. It's because it sounded good. He never been to Transylvania, <laughs> and he, you know, but he was a man of the theater and you know and, and and as a writer that's what you do you know you it's like finding as an actor you finding the right hat you can't go on until you find the right hat um you know with 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 a writer it's the same way sometimes you know you just you'll you'll spend a day just trying to find the right name uh for a character and you know it's not right you know you know you you just you, you don't it's it's right when it's right you know so sometimes it's just that it's just it, you know, this is, uh, and it's it sound. You know, sound is so important. You know, having a good ear is so incredibly important in almost any art. You know, whether you're a musician or a singer, uh, whatever. You know, and for writers, having a good ear is very, very important. Not only for dialogue, but also for uh, the way things sound, the way characters' names sound, or what it tells you about it. You know. Nobody was better at that than Dickens. Dickens was was a master of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's another thing. You know, I'm sure somebody gave J.K. Rowling Dickens. You know, you know, because she she has these names like Dumbledore and Hogwarts and things like this is right out of Dickens. You know, it was like you know, <laughs> and you have an abused boy who becomes the hero of the story. Yeah, you know, that's that's Dickens. You know, um, so. You know, that's why I say, you know, you 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 always want to get up and applaud because somebody gave somebody good books to read. It, it, speaking of good books, uh, when, when you were talking with Clancy, uh, did did you talk with him about uh, uh, Highlander or oh, yeah. SpongeBob? Well, you know, one of the things I asked him was because you know he has been in his share of cult things. Um, 
you know, uh, and and I'm always curious about that, you know, and, and my my question, the way I put it to people is always, when people come up to you at the airport, you know, what do they know you for? You know, is it because, you know, you do Mr. Krabs, the voice of Mr. Krabs on, on is, is that the reason? That that they know you, you know, and now currently he's been on Billions. He's got a new series coming up on ABC. But um, yeah, I said, is it that? Um, is it uh, people who remember something like Starship Troopers or Carnival? Uh, because like I said, he's been in his share of these kind of cult things that, that people remember. Uh, is it the Adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai that he's in? Um, is it Highlander, you know, or is it the Shawshank Redemption? And, and, you know, as Clancy said, it's a little bit of everything. It really is. It depends. You know, if you see somebody coming up and they got young kids, you know, it's going to be SpongeBob. And he said, but you can almost tell from the way somebody's looking at you, what it's going to be, that it's going to be Highlander. <laughs> it's going to be Shawshank. You know? <laughs> that, um, you know, and that's great as an actor, when you have those kind of things that make real connections with people you know and they're very very different i mean you know he's played some really really out there big characters you know um you know highlander is certainly one of those that's equal to um uh, the shawshank in the sense right. of you know you know what are these 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 wonderfully you know bigger than 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 than, than evil characters <laughs> so um like I say, he, you know, he, he, but, but Clancy is just a, you know, it's a, I was really glad I got to him because he's such a good storyteller and he's from Ohio. You know, he grew up oh. in a town called Urbana, oh, okay. um, which is about an hour away from Mansfield. And his parents were still, his parents are still alive. Um, as a matter of fact, his, his father, Lou Brown, was a congressman from Ohio who ran for governor, uh, he ran for governor and lost. Um, so Clancy uh, and both his parents are still alive, uh, but he was, uh, you know, he was an Ohio boy. He, was, he grew up here, so you know, he was, um, he knew what Ohio summers were all about. He knew what this was, you know, and and he also because Urbana was like an hour away. It's not like he had to go home to see his parents on weekends or something like this. It was sort of like being able to come home and have that like boys' clubhouse experience that he had when they were making the movies. So, um, you know, like I said, almost everybody I know had, a uh, had happy set, had happy experiences on this, on this film. Like, nobody said, you know, boy, that was terrible. I hated it. People remember the, like I said, the heat, not just the heat, but like, you know, up at the prison, um, when they shot inside the prison, the heat, Outside was on a, on a given day was in the 90s, and the heat inside the prison with the lights and everything soared up. So they were they were filming under you know really really you know uh, brutal uh, experiences, and then there were flies. The flies were really thick, so they had to leave the windows open to have some circulation. And when they did, flies came pouring in up there, and that ruined many a shot. So it was heat and flies. That they were they were back so okay and uh, you know mark we're down to i don't know about five six minutes left um yeah um uh, you you have you know some upcoming appearances you know plug your website and you know we talk about that for a little bit and you know call, call that a wrap for our special thursday night edition of nightlight sure well I, i'm I'm doing several Shawshank talks here in Ohio coming up uh, next Thursday night, uh, the 19th. I'm at the, uh, the Akron Summit County Library in downtown at, at 7 o'clock. And then uh, on Saturday, the, uh, the, the 28th, I'm at the Middleburg Heights Library up in Cuyahoga County at 2 o'clock. Um, and the following Tuesday uh, at 7 o'clock down at the Parma Heights Library, these are all Shawshank uh, talks. And then on October 22nd, I'm at the Nordonia Hills Library. So if anybody's in um, uh, shouting distance of uh, Northeast Ohio and you want, you're a Stephen King fan or a Shawshank fan, come on by and uh, we'll talk Shawshank. 
And then, of course, I'll be at the Twilight Zone gathering um, in, in Binghamton in, in a couple of weeks. Okay. We'll get together there and talk, talk, talk a little bit about everything. Uh, uh, are, are you going to be uh, uh, presenting again? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, um, my wife, Sarah, and I are working up a uh, – last year I did a, a talk about um, – Comparing Rod Serling and Mark Twain and the influences of uh, the influences that were similar between them in their work. And uh, this year, Sarah and I are working up something which is going to talk about Rod Serling and Charles Dickens. And uh, I think it's going to be fun. Uh, uh, yeah, that sounds sounds very interesting. Yeah, the one the, the uh, Rod Serling Mark Twain comparison uh, was r- really interesting with the. Um, yeah, their uh, war careers and smoking. Oh yeah, and 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 their and their personalities. The fact that they were both Type A personalities, and they they both were moralists in disguise. Just that Twain used humor and uh, Rod Serling used fantasy, but they used them in the same way, which was to be uh, were both uh, teaching moral lessons. Yeah. Right. And uh, if, if people want to get a hold of uh, the Shawshank Redemption revealed, uh, then get your website or a- Amazon. What? Oh, okay, it's in the, it's in Barnes and Noble at this point, uh, so it's available at, at at Barnes and Noble stores. It's available uh, through Amazon, and uh, in and. Um, I, like I said, and I will be uh, doing. A, a, I'll bring it with me. I'm going to bring 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 copies of it with me to Binghamton. Um, uh, Ann Serling and I are doing a, uh, a Twilight Zone event at Elmira College uh, at the end of the month. Um, you know, so I'll probably be bringing copies there. So you know, I'll be I'll be out and about wherever I go. I take uh, I take the books with me. They don't do any good sitting at home, so they're in the trunk of my car. So. Yeah. You know, it. it, it yeah, you, your um, Shawshank Redemption revealed r- r- really a, a terrific book. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, j- just here, I, I just like it, it, like watching those you know behind the uh, music type shows on like the making of you know Sergeant Pepper or some, you know some, you know some of these famous. Uh, CDs and you know your books, you know, just ranks up there with you know just just presenting all those little details that make the movie so uh, celebrated 25 years later. And like you said, it, it is ranking up there with uh, you know like The Godfather, or, you know, probably Citizen Kane. I mean, th- th- those are like huge honors. And you know you're part of it. You 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 uh, chronicle the history of making that movie. Well, I thank you, but I'll, I'll tell you the truth: the the phrase "labor of love" doesn't even begin to cover this one. Um, I had a blast uh, researching this. I, as I said before, I did 70 interviews for this book. I could have gone on and done 70 more easily and happily. Easily and happily, I could have done 70 more interviews for this book because I loved hearing the stories. And if this book is any good at all, it's because of the stories that people shared with me. Yeah, it it is a really good one. So I encourage people to go out and get it. And, you know, uh, Barbara's telling me we're getting pretty close to the end of the show. Uh, Barbara, do you want to uh, – yeah, we can just kind of wrap, wrap it up now. Um, she says – one one minute left. So, Mark, I just want to thank you. You know, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks, and uh, we'll get the archive to you uh, tomorrow. This is just a terrific show. Th- thank you so much for giving us a great education on movie making. Oh well, like I said, you know, I could I could go on talking about Shawshank all night because it it, it really is near and dear to my heart, and uh, it was an honor to do this book. It, it was an honor to share this. You know, Frank Darabont talked about feeling the pressure of doing justice to Stephen King's story. I felt ju- the, the pressure of doing justice 
to this movie and the, the stories that people shared with me. Uh, uh, you did that, and you know, I just want to thank you again. Thank you, Barbara, for producing tonight, and we'll see everyone next Tuesday.